Hi, I'm Nancy Pearl. Welcome to Book Lust. My guest today at the Women's University Club in Seattle is Martha Brockenbro. Martha, thank you for coming, first of all. Thanks for having me. You might notice I did no adjective before your name. <laughs> and the reason for that is, um, yeah, I could have said writer, Martha Brockenbro, but I didn't want to say young adult writer or young adult novelist. And because when I read your brand new book, The Game of Love and Death, I thought, this is, as your website says, book, a book for smart kids. And I wouldn't even say juvenile adults. I would say it's for adults. I, I think this is one of those books that really, in a wonderful, wonderful way, makes that bridge between older young adult readers and adult readers. I, I didn't have small ambitions when I set out <laughs> to write the book. It, it actually started out as a contemporary story and I felt as though that setting in time didn't allow me to explore the themes that I really wanted to get into. And, and so, uh, you know, there's one fact of life that we all die. And so what role does love play in that, in who we love and in how we love? And to me, that's the biggest and most important thing you can write about. Others may disagree, but I wanted this to be the book that had everything in me accumulated over the course of my life and put onto the page in a way that I think should engage readers. Well, it certainly engaged me. I can, I, I can say that. I mean, it was hard for me to put it down because I wanted to see how you were going to work this all out and, and what was going to happen to the characters. That was a source of tension for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, how much, do you want to give us your, your elevator pitch for the book so we can have a little context okay, for it? Okay, so to put it in context, The Game of Love and Death is set in Seattle in 1937. And there are two teen characters, Flora, who is an African-American girl who co-owns a jazz club. It used to be her parents. It's with her uncles. She dreams of becoming a pilot, which, you know, this was 1937 was the year Amelia Earhart died. So it was a major year in the history of aviation for women. But there was the history of African-American women being pilots. So anyway, that's Flora. Henry is the boy she falls in love with. He is the adopted son of a wealthy white family. They happen to own a newspaper. I used to be a newspaper reporter. And so that felt like an important part of the world. So they fall in love with each other. He's also a jazz musician. They fall in love. They don't know that they're pawns being played by love and death themselves, who appear as characters. So when I was a child, I read mythology constantly. I loved it. You probably are familiar with the Childcraft mythology books. So we, <laughs> we had all of them. And what I really thought was cool was how the Greek gods walked the earth and they were basically terrible people. And so I wanted to have such terrible, powerful people in my book as well. And I guess that was a really long elevator ride. Elevator pitches are supposed to be much shorter. Um, but you know, when you've got four main characters in a book, that you know, it takes a little while to explain. Did you have trouble selling this to, to, to um, Arthur Levine at Scholastic? Well, Arthur and I have worked together on Seven. We did Divine Intervention and the Dinosaur Tooth Fairy, and we have three more picture books coming. And I just sent him two more picture book manuscripts. So we have a really solid relationship, mm -hmm. and he is one of the great geniuses in children's literature. And so um, I did, though. It took a couple of years of working on the story with him, and we had a lot of discussions about you know, it, because it it's complicated. You know, it's four different narratives that come together and they all kind of cross at the same point. And so it took me a while to get there and it also took a while to explain the concept. And the book is called The Game of Love and Death because there is some structure given by an underlying game. And in the game, there's a simple roll of the dice. I wish I had happened upon that simple roll of the dice many years before I did, because it was, it was complicated. And part of my research is, okay, what kind of game is this? Is it like Dungeons and Dragons? Because I love Dungeons and Dragons and you know, find that fascinating. No, it was not like Dungeons and Dragons because that would be a very complicated way of telling a story in a book. And then I thought, all right, 
poker. Maybe it's like poker. And I researched, I, I was in, I think it was the Brooklyn Art Museum, and I saw this ancient Persian precursor to poker called Asnas, and I researched that and thought about, okay, these cards, they come to life. No, it was also <laughs> not that. And then I thought, okay, riddles. And I considered riddles, and I wrote a bunch of riddles and was trying to have them tie into the plot, into the theme, and was just too complicated. And I have this other friend, Elizabeth Law, who's an editor in New York, and she finally said, you know, Martha, simplicity is your friend. And so um, I, tried to, I tried to welcome that friend back into the attic where I write, and I, you know, I eventually did get to that. I knew, though, that it wasn't going to be chess, because I did not want a chess piece on the cover of the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and riddles, in fact, when I think of riddles as, as, as part of the a plot of a children's book or a book for um, young readers, then I always think of The Hobbit. And, and so the, maybe that was a really wise decision, because in some ways riddles are I'm not going to do done. a riddle better than, right. than Gollum. I mean, right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, riddles are really nice thematically, and because, it's, you know, something like love, there's not necessarily a simple answer, but when you see it, that's all you can see. Mm -hmm. And so I did like it from that point of view, but, you know, sometimes we just have to abandon things that aren't working in both writing and in life. And uh, so there, was, there were many, many ships I abandoned. <laughs> uh, really? For, for this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I, you know, I, there was a character in there, memory, because, you know, right. love and death and memory, you know, who, what we remember of the people we love. Right. And, and he ended up jumping off a bridge. And this is where I learned the lesson. Like, if one of your characters commits suicide, that is a, a signal that you should cut them right out of the book. <laughs> they don't want to be there. <laughs> and so memory was cut. Um, and, uh, you know, and just many things. Changed. So in the in the um, in the conflict between love and death, and and Henry and Flora being the pawns in this centuries-old conflict between love and death, death always wins. So what were your special challenges to keep the book moving, knowing that death is going to win? It's. So endings of books are really difficult. And Richard Peck says something you know, great, and he's got this Richard Peck voice. Um, actually, that was more Gregory Peck, but Richard Peck also <laughs> has. Isn't he his son? <laughs> <laughs> we'll pretend for the yeah, sake of right. it's, it's hereditary, that voice. Right. Um, and so he says, you know, the, the first paragraph of your book must contain its ending. And so as I write, I always like to know what the ending of the book is, because then I know what I'm moving toward. I don't necessarily know how I'm going to get there. The end has to feel inevitable, but I also hope that's surprising. And, you know, spoiler alert, we are all going to die. <laughs> ah. um, and so, you know, how you get there and what sort of death you have is the question, you know, one of the questions I was asking with the book. And so yeah, it was, I had to consider a lot of things and, you know, what makes a book interesting is what makes people interesting, and it's specific things, and it's shared experiences, and it's stuff that we can relate to. And so I, you know, thought about bringing in as many of those things as I possibly could. A lot of the elements of the story, so it's historical. In 1937, Amelia Earhart died. The Hindenburg blew up. There was the bombing of Guernica. And so there were these three major events, all involving aircraft, and I had already decided that Flora was a pilot before I went back and kind of considered all the events of 1937. And so it really felt predestined to me. But, it, you know, I had personal relationships with a lot of those things. When I was writing for Encarta, I wrote about Amelia Earhart. Um, when I was 16 and a student at Lakeside in Seattle, my art teacher, Robert Fulgham, who went on to become a very famous writer, showed us Picasso's painting of Guernica, and he was using it to demonstrate a concept called paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift there is, for the first time ever, they were using this new technology, airplanes, to destroy a city from a great distance, from above, you know, with, with very little risk to the pilots. And so I wanted to have that. When I was in sixth grade, I had a teacher, Christian Melgard, who played us, he was teaching us about hydrogen, and he played us the audio recording of the Hindenburg, oh, the Hindenburg. disaster. 
And that line, oh, the humanity, I actually had it in there and my editor said, oh, you should cut that because it feels like a joke. And to me, it wasn't a joke that death was saying, oh, the humanity, but mm -hmm. it, you know, it read that way, so cut. Um, but anyway, so all of those things are in there and, you know, they're things that people who've read history, you know, we have that as a reference point. Or if you don't, if you're younger, now all of a sudden you have something that you could go learn more about. And so I, you know, I think that's one of the things that makes it interesting. So the brilliance of the novel, one of the aspects of, of, of this novel's uh, just wonderful, wonderful um, appeal, I think, is that you, once you have death as a character, you can see her hand, you, you get to know death and her need for causing disasters like the Hindenburg or like Guernica. Um, did, did, how, how did you feel about her? I mean, how did you work to make her the character that she, that she becomes in the book? Well, I loved her and uh, she is someone, and honestly, you know, all the characters in a book I can understand their sorrows because I felt them. So death is this character. She is constructed to take life from people. And everybody hates her. I mean, when you think about human beings, what's been our primary struggle mm -hmm. is to stay alive. Death is the ultimate villain. And, you know, how would it feel to have all of the, everybody on earth hating you and fearing you? You would be so lonely all the time and you've got your, partner in the universe is love and you know who's more celebrated who's more lauded and you know we've all felt sometimes this you know aspects of self-loathing I don't like this about myself um, we've all felt this envy towards someone else who just has it better than we do and so you know I really felt for the character she's awful she's a monster um, but there's some sympathetic aspects to her and I thought that was what would perhaps make her a more interesting character. You know, people don't exist as villains in their own minds. Everyone is the hero of his or her own story. And, you know, I would imagine that even Adolf Hitler found himself to be a heroic character. And, you know, we see the evil, but how can you bring out the dimension? Because um, that's what makes a character interesting and why you would want to Right. Turn Keep pages. Right. You know, they don't have to be likable. And this is one of the things that, you know, people like, I didn't like this character. And, you know, to me, hmm, you know, that's not the judge of whether a character is a good one. It's, you know, were you interested in this character? Right. And did this character's point of view on the world illuminate something for you that you didn't know? Or did it put something you did know into words that, you know, you immediately recognize their truth? So that's more my goal. What, was this a much longer book when mm -hmm. you finished it and then you had to edit it down? This book, so I rewrote it 31 times, at least according to my, my file. And I, at some point, should just hit the delete button <laughs> and just get rid of them. Um, I, it, it, at one point, I think it's, you know, it was probably 120 pages longer at one point. And so... I cut things that maybe didn't need to be there. I tried to make the language as compressed as possible. You know, I went through and took out all sorts of extra words. There was a lot of editing and a lot of revising. Um, you know, would I like to expand on it? Absolutely. And I would love to tell Ethan's story. Ethan, yes. Ethan is right. a secondary character in the book. So his parents are the ones who adopt Henry. And Ethan has a secret. He has two secrets. One is that he is dyslexic. And he's expected to take over the family newspaper, but so struggles with the language. My 14-year-old is dyslexic. And, you know, before I raised a child who had trouble reading, you know, which is the universe's great joke on a writer, is right. give her a child who struggles to read and write herself. And, you know, I learned really what dyslexia is, and it's a... It, it doesn't describe any one thing, but let's just say reading is a whole lot harder for you and you have to work much harder. And you can be extremely bright and you know, make quick connections mm -hmm. between things, but to get it down on paper is so difficult and it's so miserable. You know, when you look not smart on the page, it's devastating. 
And so that's one of his secrets. And the other secret would be, I think, a spoiler. So yeah, I, I don't we, think we should tell we won't, the other. We won't say the other secret. But, right. he, but you know, it, I could extend that story, and I've actually thought of what I would do and where I would set it, and uh, it's a matter of years of research. When I finished the book, I, I thought, um, you know, I, I finished it and I had this sort of contented sigh, like, oh, you know, you've read a book <clears throat> that's really... Uh, that really speaks to you and it's kind of a universe, you know, it not only sp spoke to me, but I could see it speaking to, to all of its readers because of the way it talks about those basic, talks about love and death and are we pawns in the hands of, of, of love and death. And then my second thought was, but what happened to Ethan? I wish I knew. Um, so I do hope, in, in a way I hope you do, and in a way I think I would be very happy just sort of imagining what happens to him. We'll talk more later. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk more later. Well, it's, you know, I did, when I was studying Guernica and I read about Picasso, there were cut scenes, other stuff from uh -huh. Picasso and other paintings that he had done. And one of, this quote that I love of his is that art is an instrument of war. You know, it's basically, it's not something to hang behind the couch. and. I have my own view on that and the type of writer who I want to be and I, you know my writing I hope is an instrument of revolution and I love the word revolution I, I loved language play and revolution contains evolution which I prefer you know I would I would rather evolve to a better place in the world than to um, force it through mm -hmm. means of violence but also as a writer I'm reflecting a worldview back to readers, and inside the word revolution is love reflected. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know the second through wow. fifth letters, mm -hmm. and so you know this is an act of revolution. And one of the reasons that I love to write for young readers, and you know I say jokingly for juvenile adults, but for young readers, because who is going to lead the revolution? It's the young readers. I have the utmost respect for young readers. I, I'm. This is not for me a marketing category, mm -hmm. even though that's really what it is in, in right. you know, our hyper-marketed world. But I'm writing about what it means to be on you know, the edge of independence, of deciding who you are and how you're going to live. And so I wanted to give young readers primarily, you know, here's a map, here's what it looked like for some people, you know, facing these crises and decisions, and you know, hopefully you know, we'll arm them for a revolution, if not of the heart, but of the mind. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't mean that juvenile adults, you know, who actually are really people who just haven't lost their sense of spirit and hope right. and possibility. Um, you know, those are the adults who I think would relate to my books. Yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking of the shame of having the game of love and death in the teen section of the library for example, and not in the adult section as well. Because I, I really felt that this was, this was one of those very special crossover books. That's what um, the Globe and Mail in Canada, just uh -huh. I think it called it adultish. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, I would love for that to happen. I would also love for people to stop um, saying that young adults aren't Moral, you know, young adult books aren't morally right. complicated. Right. You know, some of our very best adult writers are spouting absolute nonsense about this category, and you know, th they're really beautiful and wonderful books being written. They also happen to be eight dollars cheaper in hardback. Right. Um, so I count, I count that as a win, yeah. not not for me personally. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, there's there's perhaps more prestige. I've written for adults, and I've written for young readers. The very hardest books to sell are those little picture books. Those are incredibly difficult to write and incredibly mm -hmm. difficult to sell. You know, the things, when I first started writing, my daughter was one. We had a cat. The cat, my daughter loved the cat. The cat was named Lily. Lily did not love my daughter. Lily would bite my daughter and make my daughter bleed. And, you know, still my daughter would, ah, oh, pet the cat, pet the cat. Um, and you know, come to me bleeding and weeping. So my very first picture book, which is what I started out wanting to do, I was reading to my daughter and I noticed she was not paying attention to me at all. She was paying attention to the cat and not the face of the cat, which I consider the superior end. <laughs> she was paying attention to the other end. And so if you write a book that's not good, uh, your intended audience will find a cat's 
bottom to be more interesting. And it's, you know, adults actually are a lot more patient. They're, they, right. you know, they put up with a lot more garbage and not young readers. You know, there's a lot of competition for the time of young people. They're constantly being told what to read and, you know, being given these summer reading oh, assignments, oh, you know, required yeah, reading. Right. I hate required right, reading, too. hate it. Um, and, and so, it, you know, you have to write something good enough that, you know, that's more interesting than their phone, which means all their friends. <laughs> and so that's a very difficult challenge and I'm, you know, delighted to try and meet it. Well, w one of the things that I love about your books, and, and I loved Divine Intervention as well, um, is that you're a, you're a terrific writer, and what means the most to me when I'm reading is the way the words are put together. If a book isn't what I would call well written, I I can't read it. And I I just marked um, three just three little section three sentences in here, but um, this is this is one that just struck me. I mean, I would even call these throwaway sentences. They're not even important sentences in, in the moving the plot forward, but they're so well done. Not long before Flora's flight, love had materialized in Venice, a city made more beautiful by the fact that it was doomed. Isn't that, a, I mean, what a, what a great, that, what a great sentence. Thank you. I, I wrote that after I went to Venice. I, I <laughs> and then it's like, how can I possibly work Venice into this story? <laughs> but the Campanile in Venice, the um, Union Station in Seattle, that brick right. tower was modeled after that. And so all of a sudden, I did find a connection. You know, it's there's Linda Sue Park, who's won a Newbery Award and is just a fantastic writer. She says, you cannot have a detail in your story that you don't somehow echo later. And so I really tried to take right. that to heart. And once I was at a conference and this fabulous librarian, Nancy Pearl, talked about a word that repeated itself in a book. And she says, you know, you cannot repeat a special word like that in a book. Right. <laughs> and so I go through my book and I look at, there's, I use software called Scrivener. And one of the features is it shows you all the words you were, that you used and how many times you've used them. And certain words you can use repeatedly. Right, right, correct. So other words, you know, glistening one time. Right. You've got one shot. Make it a good one. Um, and so, that, you know, that's the sort of discipline that I like to apply. And probably why I'll never be one of those writers who has multiple books a year. Yeah, right. um, or even a book every year, because it takes a long time. Well, especially for a book that so, um, has such a, a complicated plot that needs a lot of threads tied together to make it end satisfactorily for the reader. So here's another one. Um, so this is something that Flora says toward the end of the book, and, and she says, game or no, she would someday die as all living beings did, but that wasn't the tragedy, nor was there tragedy in being a pawn. All souls are, if not of eternal beings, then as pawns of their own bodies. The game, whatever shape it takes, lasts only as long as the body holds out. The tragedy, every time, is choosing something other than love. Oh, Martha. <laughs> but you know, that's like the, the, I love letters. And I love writing letters to people I care about. And I do it all the time. And this is a very long letter to the people in the world who I love whether I know them or whether I don't. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that inspired the story, my very first book, the one that's not there because it's out of print, um, was a, uh, It Could Happen to You, A Diary of a Pregnancy and Beyond. And so a couple of years after it came out, and this was, you know, based on essays that I had written uh, about becoming a mother. And a few years after it came out, I received an email from a 15-year-old girl. And she's asking me about writing, and I'm always happy to talk with people about writing, and particularly when they're students, because I had no one to talk to about writing when I wanted to become a writer. And so we continued our correspondence, and eventually she started asking me questions about pregnancy, and all of a sudden <laughs> I realized why she had read my book and why she had really been writing to me is she was afraid she was pregnant. So she was 15, a Catholic girl. I was raised in a Catholic family, and so I knew all of a sudden, you know, the, the weight of her situation. And 
So I walked her through, you know, an email, and it was a horribly risky feeling thing because um, I didn't know this girl. You know, she lived right. in Wisconsin, and so I walked her through the process of getting tested, and she was tested and positive, and I said, you know, and I, she had to tell people she was pregnant, and I'm like, tell me about the father of the child because I wanted to make sure that he seemed safe. And she told me that they had known each other. She was seven, he was eight. And they had been out riding their bicycles. He was, you know, just the boy down the street. They'd been out riding their bicycles. She fell off and broke her leg. He carried her home. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the images that I ended up cutting, you know, Michelangelo's sculpture, La Pieta, which is really? Mary holding Jesus. It's one of the most beautiful sculptures in the world. And I just imagined him carrying her in that way, brought her home. The next day, she found her bicycle leaning against the house. So it wasn't just that he'd carried her home, he'd brought back the bicycle. And so, you know, some years later, they were fooling around and got pregnant on both of their first mm -hmm. times. And uh, so I wanted to write Henry as a character in this book, as a boy who loved that well mm -hmm. and that directly. And, you know, when you're able to carry someone who's suffering, that's a really beautiful and brave thing that's underrated and under talked about. You know, there's so much attention given to chiseled abs and, you know, alabaster pectorals. And it's really, it has much more to do with um, our willingness to hold each other in those dark times. And so it, to me, that book, I didn't write it for 15 year old girls. I wrote it for, you know, self-absorbed mothers like myself. And yet she found it. And sometimes the right book at the right time changes someone's life. And, you know, that book was, it made her life slightly better. It's, mm -hmm. you know, a difficult thing, but they are married, raising their child. And so what I'm hoping is that someday, you know, somebody reads this book and they have some sort of dream they want to do or some sort of love they want to have. And they realize there is no time to waste. There just isn't. Martha Brockenborough, thank you so much for being on Book Lust today. Thanks for having me.